Hello, in this video we will talk about something that will make your life much easier and that would be binomial probability distributions. So a binomial probability distribution is a type of discrete probability distribution and we'll talk now about what constitutes as being binomial. So a binomial probability distribution arises from a fixed number of independent what we call Bernoulli trials. So in other words the following four requirements must be met. So the procedure has a fixed number of trials. The trials are independent. That means the probability of the first trial or the outcome of the first trial does not impact the probability of any of the following trials and so forth. Each trial only has two outcomes. So two possible outcomes, one of which is called a success, the other which is called a failure. It either happens or it doesn't. The probability of a success in one trial is represented by the little letter P, and the probability of a failure is represented by Q. Together, P plus Q add up to 1. Because remember, you have only two outcomes, and the outcomes total in a probability distribution, the probabilities must add to 1. So therefore, we know that Q is always 1 minus P. So some notation we'll be working with. N is the number of trials. X is the number of successes we're looking for. P is the probability of a success. Q is the probability of a failure. And P of X represents the probability of getting a certain number of successes among the trials. So be sure that X and P both refer to the same category called a success. For instance, if you're flipping a coin and you're looking at the coin landing on heads. A success would be the coin landing on heads. That's the behavior you're looking for. So <clears throat> you want P, your probability, to correspond to the probability of getting heads. One other thing to look out for is that a success is not always necessarily a good thing. Like when you're talking about diseases and survival rate or people passing away from a disease. A success could be deemed as someone dying from a specific disease or condition. So it's the behavior we're looking at. It's not always a positive thing. It could be giving a, a test trial of some drugs to people and a success could be the person gets a headache. So it's whatever is being observed. It's not always a positive thing. So now with the following result in the binomial probability distribution or a binomial experiment, whatever you want to call it. If so, we will identify N, P, and Q. So when an adult is randomly selected, there is a 0.85 probability that this person knows what Twitter is. We want to know the probability that exactly three of five randomly selected adults know of Twitter. So we need to run through the four conditions, <coughs> or the four requirements. Condition one, is there a fixed number of trials? Yes, it says five randomly selected adults, so there's five trials. So that's good. Two. Are the trials independent? Yes, the trials are independent. You go up to the first person, you ask them if they know what Twitter is, they give you their response, and you just move right along to the second person. They are independent of each other. All right, three. Our third requirement is each trial has two possible outcomes called a success and failure. So what would be deemed a success here? Well, it'd be knowing what Twitter is. And what would be the failure? Not knowing what Twitter is. So not knowing Twitter. And then our fourth requirement was that the probability of a success in one trial's P. So is there a probability of knowing what Twitter is? Well, when an adult is randomly selected, there is a 0.85 chance that the person knows what Twitter is. So yes, we know the probability of a success, the probability an adult knows what Twitter is. So yes, the, the experiment is binomial. We'll talk about why this is important momentarily. What about the following experiment? Five cards are randomly selected from a 52 card deck without replacement, and the number of diamond cards selected is recorded. 
So here we have our fixed number of trials, five cards. So in my conditions, we have five trials. Second condition, independent. So I go through and on my first trial, I pick out a card. But I don't replace it. It says without replacement. So what does that mean for the second trial? Well, it means there's now one less card in the deck. And what does that mean? Well, it means it's going to change the probability of your next card selection because now you only have out of 51 cards instead of out of 52. So unfortunately, the trials are not independent because of the word or the keywords without replacement. Without replacement means not independent. So immediately this experiment is disqualified from being a binomial probability distribution. So not binomial, sorry. Go find another club to join. So to kind of scaffold us into the binomial probability distribution formula, I want us to do some probability calculations by hand. So on a multiple choice test, that would be choices with A, B, C, or D as the answers. There are three questions. A student randomly selects answers for each of the three questions. Find the probability the student chooses one correct answer. So I'm going to let C equal <coughs> correct. And let W equal wrong. <clears throat> so my ultimate goal is to find out what is the probability that the student gets one correct answer out of the three questions. <clears throat> so let's think about all the ways the student could get one answer correct. I would have to calculate, okay, first answer is correct. The second two are wrong. I could get only the middle question correct. I could get only the last question correct. Those are, there's three ways you could get exactly one correct answer. And I'm going to calculate the probabilities of each of these. That's why I put the equal signs there. I was getting ambitious. So what's going to happen here is I need to calculate, okay, the probability I get the first question correct times the probability I get the second question wrong times the probability I get the third question wrong. So this is literally going to be, okay, what's the probability you get the first question correct? Out of four answer choices, there's only one that is correct, so one-fourth times. What is the probability you get the second question wrong? There's three wrong answers out of four. So you have times 3 out of 4, and the same goes for the third question, 3 out of 4. So that's going to give me, when I multiply everything together, I get 0.141. Okay, so that's one outcome's answer, 0 0.141. Well, let's do wrong, correct, wrong. Well, what is the probability of, let me write this out. What is the probability of getting the first question wrong? And that's 3 out of 4. Second question correct times 1 out of 4. And then third question wrong, 3 out of 4 again. It's the same fractions being multiplied together in a different order. So still 0.141. Alright, let's do wrong, wrong, correct now. And you might kind of know where I'm heading here. It's literally 3 over 4 times 3 over 4 times 1 over 4. And you're going to get 0.141. You do 3 times 3 to get 9, 4 times 4 times 4 to get 64. 9 over 64 is 0.141. The same probability again. So even though my correct answer was a different one of the questions in each of these possible scenarios, I still got the same probabilities. So if I add up these three three decimals or these three probabilities, I get point, point 0.423.
That is the probability you get exactly one answer correct out of the three. Now, you want to take this into account because literally all I could have had done was know that there's three possible outcomes in terms of getting one of the questions correct, and all I had to do was calculate one of the probabilities. Because once you know one of the probabilities, times it by three because there's three different ways you can get one correct answer, and that would give you the answer as well. So there are some shortcuts there, but that is just one possible scenario is getting one answer correct. You could get no answers correct. You could get two answers correct. You could get three answers correct. If I was building a probability distribution, I would have to compute the probabilities for four rows, and that's very exhausting. So we have to have some sort of shortcut or remedy for that sort of tedious task. So that's where we're about to learn. So if an experiment's binomial, I have good news for you. If an experiment's binomial, then that means we can calculate the probability of a certain number of successes or outcomes occurring using a formula or using Google Sheets. So what the formula states is the probability of a certain number X successes occurring in N trials is the following. So literally you take the number of successes you have or you want and you multiply the probability of a success together that many times. So for instance in the previous question I wanted one correct answer so I had one-fourth appear in each of my calculations. And then you multiply by the probability of a failure to how many times or how many failures you'll have. So for instance in the previous exercise the probability of a failure was three-fourths. I had two wrong questions in each of my possible scenarios so I multiplied three-fourths twice in terms of my probabilities. And then to take into account the fact that you can get one correct answer or whatever you're dealing with in various ways, for instance if you have three questions the number of ways to get only one correct is given using the combination formula. Three choose one. That's what this n factorial expansion is. It's the combination formula. So that's where the probability binomial probability formula comes from. So you're taking your probability of a success, multiplying it by how many successes you have, you have probability of a failure, multiply that failure probability by how many failures you have. So if your failure probability is three-fourths, you do three-fourths times three-fourths if you're interested in two failures. And then you have your combination formula to represent that a certain number of successes can occur a certain number of ways. So it's kind of a cool formula and it's got a really nice background to it. But we need to practice a little bit on how to use it. So just to recall, n is the number of trials, x is the number of successes you're looking at, p is the probability of a success in a single trial, and q is the probability of a failure in a single trial. q equals 1 minus p. So there's my explanation of the, the probability formula for the binomial experiments. Like I said, we'll use Google Sheets to do the calculation, but you should know kind of where the formula comes from. Otherwise, you won't appreciate it as much. So we will use Google Sheets. I'll show you that in a moment. So on a multiple choice test, there are three questions. A student randomly selects answers for each of the three questions. Find the probability the student chooses one correct answer. Let's do this binomial style. So the experiment is binomial. So feel free to look at your notes or look at the previous video or the beginning of this video and make sure you know why. So we have a certain number of trials. We have three questions and we have a success. A success is getting an answer correct or getting question correct, I should say. And what is my probability of a success? What's P? What's the probability of getting a question correct? Well, there's a 1 in 4 chance of getting a single question correct. That's a 0.25 probability. So literally, all you need to know when you go through and do Google Sheets is... I'll make a little list over here. When you go through and do Google Sheets, you need to know how many trials you have. You need to know the probability of a success, 
this may not be the order we input them, but I just need to list them. And you need to have the number of successes you're looking at. You're looking at exactly one question correct. So I'm looking for the probability that the number of questions correct is equal to one. So let's go to Google Sheets. So we will go to the Compute tab, and we are going to focus our attention on the binomial region. So we input in first our number of trials. Our number of trials is 3. The probability of getting a question correct is 0.25. That's our P. And then lower bound and upper bound. If you're only interested in one success or one correct answer, you write from 1 to 1. That's saying I'm only interested in the outcome when there's one success. When there's one question correct. So when you have exact, you use the same number for both the lower and upper bounds. So you get about 0.422. So this is more precise than our previous calculation. We get 0.422 because we don't have to worry about any crazy rounding error in our mid calculations. So this formula is really nice. It gives us more of an exact answer. Let's continue the practice using the binomial formula for calculating probabilities. In a clinical test of a drug, 81.3% of the subjects treated with 10 milligrams of a certain drug experienced headaches. Five subjects were randomly tested. Five subjects. And then 81.3% experienced a headache. Find the probability exactly three subjects experience headaches. So a success is getting a headache. That's the behavior or the outcome we're looking at. I told you it's not always something positive. So success is getting a headache. What is the probability of someone getting a headache? It's 81.3% or 0.813. So find the probability exactly three experience a headache. So Google Sheets, the number of trials is five. There's five subjects. The probability of getting a headache is 0.813, and then we're looking at exactly 3. So that means lower bound and upper bound will both be 3. We'll go to Google Sheets in a minute. Next, find the probability that more than one subject will experience headaches. So the probability that the number of people getting headaches will be greater than 1. So n equals 5, p equals 0.813, and we're looking for x is greater than 1. Is it reasonable to expect that more than one subject will experience a headache? We'll analyze that after we do our calculation. So when, when, when I go to Google Sheets, when x equals 3 for part a, I'm going to type 3 for both my lower and upper bound. When x is greater than 1, my lower bound will be 2, because think about numbers that are greater than 1, it would be 2, and my upper bound would be 5, because you can't have any more than 5. There's only 5 trials, so you can't have more than 5 people with a headache. So let's go to Google Sheets, and number of trials is 5, probability of someone getting a headache is 0.813. For part A, we said exactly 3, so 0.188. 0.188, and then for part B, we said we're looking for greater than 1, or more than 1. So our lower bound would be 2. You can't do 1 because more than does not include 1, and it goes all the way to 5. You get 0 0.995, 0 0.995. So we got 0 0.188, and then we got 0.995. So is it reasonable to expect more than one subject will experience headaches? Look at the probability from B. I say yes. That's because the probability x is greater than 1, that more than one person will experience a headache, is 0.995. That's an introduction to binomial probability distributions and how to use the formula for their calculations. Thanks for watching.